Good morning. morning. Happy Sunday. So I have to say, this week, I had the opportunity to travel to the Pacific Northwest. And they say it's always raining there. However, the five days I was there, it was sun shining every day. And I land at BWI, and it's been raining for the last two days. I don't really know what to make of that, but anyways. Well, before we get into worship today, welcome to all of you that join us regularly, but also the new faces. I know we may have some members of the class of 53 joining us this week, so welcome. And we do have a few announcements that we would like you to be aware of. Old Fashioned Hymn Sing, May 5th, 7 p.m., all are welcome. As we come to the end of the semester, the baccalaureate and book signing service will be on May 21st, so mark your calendars for that. And we want to give a thank you for all those that give weekly that allow us to fund so many different activities and events to minister to our midshipmen. So now I please join you, join me, to stand for church call and remain standing for the call to worship. The call to worship today comes from Exodus 1, or 15, 1 and 2. Moses said to the Israelites, they sang a song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Going down to verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, today we proclaim your name, that you are awesome, that you are majestic, that you work wonders, miracles, and you redeem. So we ask you, as we go into worship and word today, to be in our hearts. For all the things that are binding us down that we let go of, all the things that are hindering our heart, we just let them flow away. God, we come in wanting to engage with you this morning. Work among us, O Lord, this day. Amen.
church, why don't we sing that one again this morning? Church, you may be seated. The first scripture lesson is written in the second chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 42. Listen to the word of the Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved." The Word of the Lord. The second scripture lesson is written in the second chapter of First Peter, beginning with verse 19. Listen to the Word of the Lord. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in His steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in His mouth. And when He was abused, He did not return abuse. And when He suffered, He did not threaten. But He entrusted Himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardians of your souls. The word of the Lord. 
Please remain seated for our response in song.
Please stand in reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson is written in the 10th chapter of John, beginning in verse 1. Listen to the word of the Lord. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold of the gate, but climbs in another way as a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gate holder, gatekeeper, opens the gate for him, and the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whosoever enters by me will be saved, will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of the Lord. We greet you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. God is so good. If you can do me a favor, everyone stand back to your feet real quickly. And just greet three people, say, good morning, so great to see you. So great to see you. Someone once said that the church is really a hospital for the spiritually sick, amen. And so it's so good to greet each other and, and I welcome you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. First of all, let's give God some praise for this wonderful choir and this phenomenal organist um, in the personality of Monty. I am excited about what God is doing in our midst. Um, and my prayer today, this morning, is that you catch this fire. And I wanna apologize in advance because I may get a little happy up here, amen? So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, for your, your spirit. And God, I pray that you will speak through me. I will be your microphone. Save, set free, and deliver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The fundamental question before us today is simple yet significant. Brief yet bold. Precise yet prophetic. It is as if the Spirit of the living God wants us to answer without a shadow of a doubt and or a sense of double-mindedness. Who is your shepherd Really? So I need your help. I want you to ask your neighbor, say, neighbor. Don't, don't be afraid of them. Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Who is your shepherd? Really? Before we hastily respond to this inquiry, it will serve us well to apply the wisdom of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 that says, in all of your getting, get understanding. Now, there are three things I submit that we should fully understand or let permeate in our spirit as it relates to this particular inquiry. Number one, we are sheep. Over 500 times, we find this metaphor of an animal assigned to God's people again, again, and yes, again. Now, if I'm honest, I don't like being called a sheep, how? I would rather be called an eagle soaring in the midst of the storm or a lion, a fierce ruler of the jungle. But no, God refers to us as sheep. Now, here is why I don't like the term sheep. First of all, sheep are naive. 
Sheep aren't the most critical thinkers on the planet. No, they aren't gifted at saying, hmm, what big teeth do you have there, Mr. Wolf? <laughs> and, if, and if I'm honest, I can be that. Have you ever worked on a team of so-called Christians and you felt like everybody was just loving the Lord, but really it turned out to be a mafia? Uh, I'm going to preach to myself then. Okay. Yeah. We can be naive. And if the truth of the matter, is, uh, the truth of the matter is that sometimes sheep don't ask critical questions. And I don't like being called a sheep. The second thing about a sheep, a sheep is defenseless. All they have in the face of an aggressive attack or threat is a bad. <laughs> that's all they got is a, is a bad. That's, that's it. Sheep are defenseless. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you've done everything in your power? You've prayed, you fasted, you, you loved, you did everything, you, and you still had your back against a wall. You felt like you didn't, know what you, you didn't know what else to do. It's in those moments that we feel defenseless. And I'm convinced that some of us here under the sound of my voice can relate to being a sheep and defenseless. Sheep also have the propensity to go astray. Because of their lack of critical thinking, they have the propensity to wander off and to get into things they don't have any business doing. And if I'm honest, I can be that way. And if you're honest, you can be that way also. And this is why Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 says it this way. All of we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned away everyone to his or her ways. Now, in light of the above, we have to be careful. Why? Because there's one whose assignment is to steal, kill, and to destroy us, according to John chapter 10, verse 10. And contrary to conventional wisdom, he does not wrap himself in the midst of disdain. On the contrary, the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. Hear me, beloved. 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14, that the devil will disguise himself as an angel of light. You have heard those prophetic, poetic, and comforting words in Psalms 23. But have you ever pondered what was going on in the life of King David as he penned through the Holy Spirit those words? I know I have. I've, my first thought had to have gone to King Saul running behind David for seven years simply because the Lord had anointed him to be the next king of Israel. And in my sanctified imagination, I imagined David hiding in a cave and, and Saul and his posse passed by and the Holy Spirit prompted him to write, the Lord is my shepherd. But, but upon full, further investigating the story, that wasn't the case. King David wrote Psalms 23, according to biblical scholars, after his son Absalom rose up and challenged him for the throne. Who is Absalom? 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25 says that he was the most good-looking man in the kingdom. He had long hair and had no blemish from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet. This is my wife's favorite passage, y'all. She always say amen on that one. I'm like, woman, well, be careful. Second Samuel chapter 15 verse 6 says that he stole the hearts of the people, listen, by tearing down others. You got to be careful to try to build yourself up by tearing other folk down. My grandmother, she didn't have a PhD. She had a second grade education, but she had a PhD in life. She used to say to me all the time, honey, you cannot exalt yourself standing on men's dead bones. Eventually, you will fall yourself. And he had this self-exalting spirit like the evil one. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13 says it this way, that the evil one's entire agenda in life is to exalt himself above the throne of God. Absalom is more concerned about power and obtaining the throne than caring about the sheep. 
Another way to think about this label is calling him or this spirit the Absalom spirit or a hireling. John chapter 10 verses 12 to 13 says it this way, but a hireling, he is, is not a shepherd. One who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. In the beginning, the Absalom shepherd may seem fun. He may seem exciting. He may seem full of pleasure, but in the end, the sheep will be fleeced wounded and spiritually traumatized. Why? Because the sheep knew that this was of God until the Absalom spirit literally threw him and her to the wolves. This would explain the results of a recent survey that found that nearly, listen to this, that nearly four out of 10 non-church going Americans said they avoid church because of their negative experiences with the Absalom spirit. Hurt people hurt people. Can you say amen? And because of that, I want to just give a shout out. We are, we're going to start some small, small groups. And one of the small groups, uh, we're going to call it Renew. We have Sister Meg in the house. Stand up, Meg. I see you. I know. Don't blush too much. Sister Meg is going to start a small group catered to people who have been hurt by the church. And we're going to begin to sit down and think through and pray through how can we recover through the wounds of the church. But I want to ask you a question now. Who is your shepherd really? Seemingly, as King David watched his own son, whom he loved dearly, make moves for power and not for the sheep. He came to the spiritual conclusion that you have read in Psalms 23 at verse 1. Listen to what he says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You may ask, why did David make such a bold proclamation in the midst of chaos? It was as if he heard the words of Jesus saying, John chapter 10 verse 9, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In other words, how Jesus was all in. Aren't you glad Jesus was all in? One of my favorite songs in the church goes like this. No greater love than a man has to lay down his life for a friend. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. And for me and you, he died. That's love. But that's not how the story ends. Three days later, he rose again. That's love. And that's the epitome of the good shepherd. And this is why David says, without a shadow of a doubt, I shall not want. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 says it this way. I am he that lives and that was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and death. Beloved, we don't have to want because the Lord owns it all. Don't you hear God saying the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Even a thousand cattle on the hill are, is his. There's no need for us to beg from anybody because God is our shepherd. Can you say amen? Verse 2 tells us that he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Yes, life is tough, but your God is tougher. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, God knows when we are doing too much and when we are in too much. So out of love, while we're in the midst of, our, of the grind, God will provide some green pastures and lay us down. Beloved, really this is the prelude, I would argue, to seeing the miracle of God. 
God, before God can move and really manifest his glory in our life, he has to put us at rest. Don't you hear him saying in Psalms 37, rest in the Lord and trust him. Just be still and know that he's God. God says, I see the problem. I see the concern, but trust me and rest in me. God has a way of putting us at parade rest and saying, trust me, child. Is not by might nor by power, but is by my spirit, says the living God. But also while you're resting, this is what I love about God, he will feed us. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 says it this way, that God will provide us with shepherds to feed you with understanding and with knowledge. Because he loves us, because he wants us to grow, he wants us to have a good nourishment of spirituality. He wants us to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. Our God is a God to give us our daily bread. Now, verses 2 and 3 is interesting to me, and it simply says that he leads us. Notice about God, he doesn't manipulate, he doesn't push, he doesn't run over us with a haughty spirit. Even when we are out of order, he gently leads us. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse, verse 8 says it this way, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. Let me say that again. He is the one that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. The good shepherd is going before you to fight your battles. Midshipmen, please understand that the good shepherd is going before you and giving you favor with your new command. Please understand that the good Lord is going before you and making a way out of no way. The good Lord is going before us and he's gonna lead us beside the still waters. This is what I love about God. He knows how to take care of us. He knows how to bless us with exactly what we need. He knows that we can't handle a whole lot of roughness, so he'll escort us to some calm, still waters to quench our thirst. But he'll also lead us into righteousness for his name's sake. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 says it this way, that God will open doors that no man or woman can close. Listen, but the same God who opens doors will close doors. Now, if you forget everything else, this is what I want you to remember. We have to learn to thank God for closed doors. Can you say amen? Now, I know we want what we want. But really, God closes doors not to hurt us, but really to protect us. I want to say that again. I know we want what we want, but God closes doors not to hurt us, but to protect us. Had we gone down a certain... Let me just speak for myself, because I know you guys have never made a mistake. I know you've always made the right decision. I'll make, speak for myself. Had I gone down a certain pathway and married someone who I thought was the one, oh my God, I wouldn't be here right now today. Thank God for those closed doors because God has brought me to my bride. Where is she right now? She's not here. I, honey, I love you. Just, just tell her I said I love her. Right? Sometimes God will close doors to protect you. Can you do me a favor? Touch your neighbor and say he's closed the door because he loves you. Just tell him. Just tell him. But here's the key. Here's the key. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. We have to remain sensitive to the voice of God. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says wait. But sometimes God says absolutely no. And when God says no, we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, sometimes it happens when we follow the lead of God. In verse 3, this is what's the order of the day. He restores our soul. This ministers to me. That our God, our shepherd, has the ability to restore 
our soul. The, the word restore means to bring back to his original state, use, or function. In the book, Whatever Became of Sin, the author writes, and I quote, Whatever happened to the word sin, it seems to have disappeared. It was once a proud word. It was once a strong word, a serious word. But the word went away. Why? Doesn't anyone sin anyone anymore? Doesn't anyone believe in sin? Listen to what it says. Understand that mental health and moral health are linked together, he says. Thus, agents of moral teaching, such as educators, pastors, and parents, are just as necessary as the person who does psychiatry for mental health. Now, don't get me wrong. Medicine for, for mental health can be a good thing, but it's also a great thing to allow the good shepherd to regulate your mind. The Bible says that he will give you a peace that passes all understanding, that God will give you a joy that this world cannot give and this world cannot take away. The good shepherd is in the business of restoring our soul. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I want to tell you this is your year to be restored in your mind, in your body, and everything the canker worm has eaten up. God is in the business of giving it back to you. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse number four. Here's my groove, y'all. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. <laughs> Why? Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Now, I'm not a shepherd, how, but I had to find something that looks like a, a rod. <laughs> and I had to find something that looks like a rod, right? Now, a rod is a symbol of authority, right? Now, shepherds use the rod to back off the wolves. That's what your, your good shepherd does. He, he, he uses the rod as a, as a symbol of authority to back off the predators and, and the wolves. Yes, sheep are defenseless, but our God is mighty. Don't you hear God saying, touch not my anointed, nor do my prophet no harm? Don't you know that your God is able to open doors and fight for you? All we need to do is stand still and, and see the salvation of God. Don't worry about who you don't know. Don't worry about what you don't have. Just trust God, and he will be your doctor and your lawyer in the time of need. Can you say amen? amen. His rod. They comfort me. And so I had to go find how a staff, because I don't have staffs running around the house. <laughs> Here's a staff, y'all. <laughs> I went to, um, what do you call that, Home, home Depot to get this, right? <laughs> I guess they have shepherds there, right? <laughs> now, as you know, shepherds use this, this staff, I should say. It's a staff. It's a symbol of compassion and love. And when we sheep go astray, this is what the shepherd would do. He will, he will take the hook and grab the sheep and pull that sheep back nicely and gently back into the fold, right? He would take the rod to beat off the wolf, but, but he would take he would, take, he would take the staff and hook it around his neck and, and bring the naive sheep like me and you back into the fold. I don't know who I'm talking to now, but right now, God is pulling you out of some friendships that you don't have any business being in. Amen, somebody. He's pulling you out of out of business deals that you have no, there's no ethical goodness in there whatsoever. Everything is not about money. It's about the kingdom of God. He's pulling you back in. Some of us are in some situations that he's gently pulling you back in. And this is a confirmation from God that he loves you so much that, listen to what the Bible says, that he will leave the 99 to come and get you. Today is your day. The good shepherd 
has your name. And he's looking just for you today. Now, as I bring this sermon to a close, when they bring the sheep back into the fold, something happens. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, this table is a metaphor of a public blessing or a public act of honor. This is what I love about God. When God blesses you, he makes sure your enemies have a front row seat. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> He makes sure the person who was trying to sabotage you, he makes sure that Absalom is present because he wants everybody to see what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Can you say amen? Romans chapter 8, 28 says this way, that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purposes. But not only will he prepare a table before your enemies, he will anoint you. In other words, he anoints you and lets you know that you now have a special power over your life. And now you have an obligation to go out and tell other sheep about how good God is. I got to leave you now. The other day, I took my daughter, Talia, and my son to bed, I kissed him, I prayed for him, and I said, I love you, but it's nighttime. It's about eight o'clock, it's time to go to sleep. And so in their typical form, they said, I'm not tired, I understand that, but you gotta be healthy, you need to go to sleep, I love you. So I turned the light off, all the lights were down, so I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this moment to go down and read the Word of God. That's, I just need it for me, not for preaching, I need it for me, I need to read the Word of God for me. And so I went downstairs, and all of a sudden the lights were out, and I was kind of just going because it's real dark. And I hear, I hear some, some feet. And I stop, and I look back, and I see nothing. So I kept walking, I hear some feet. Stop, hear nothing. This keeps going on for minutes. And all of a sudden I hear feet, and I hear some giggling. The next thing you know, these giggling voices and these feet, they, 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 they go faster and they hug me and they say, Daddy, we just want to tell you one last time we love you. <laughs> oh, that made my night. But I thought about that. I thought about that happens to us. Your Bible says that there are feet following you called surely goodness and mercy. They're following you all the days of your life. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, God's goodness and mercy will follow you to the ends of the earth. And today is our moment to stop and receive the love of God. Amen? I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you strayed. You've strayed. You used to have a, a fire for God, but now that fire is kind of faded out. You backslid. You, your love for God has faded. I want to pray for you in a few moments. Or maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There's no other way to get right with God, but through Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you. And after I pray at the end of the service, if you say, hey, that was me, I want to talk to you. I want to walk you through um, what they call the steps for salvation and get you right with God. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before your presence, realizing that you are our good shepherd. I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears to hear your voice. And God, where we've been hurt, where we've been wounded, where we've been disappointed, I pray that you will bring restoration and heal our soul and our spirit and our mind. For those under the sound of my voice who don't know you as Lord and Savior, 
I pray, God, that you will begin to heal and save their soul. According to your word, if we just confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. And for those who have strayed off the path, I pray, Lord, that you will stretch forth your gentle staff and pull us back into the fold for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing for our call to prayer. Lord be with you. If you would kneel or sit with me as we go into the pastoral prayer. Gracious Lord, we come to you this morning with an open heart. We confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today we seek after the one true God, the shepherd of our souls, our redeemer and savior. We acknowledge your sacrifice that you gave for our eternal freedom. And may we live today to give that love to our others. May we honor you in all we do. Knowing that in life there are trials, there are tribulations, there's suffering but only is minimal compared to the sweetness of your presence and the hope of eternal glory. I ask that you would be with those that are hurting today, physically, mentally, emotional. May they know in this moment that you see them, that you know the depths of their heart and they are not alone. May your grace and your mercy be upon us new this day. Break down the barriers that keep us from you. May we know that you are opening doors, that you're closing doors, that you're protecting us on every side. Be with our congregation. Be with our midshipmen as they go into a new season. I ask that you would keep them safe. Give them peace. Cultivate a heart that longs only for you. May we know that nothing else will do. We can search the world, but our hearts will always be empty. Lead us and guide us, O oh Lord, in all that we do. We ask for your presence. We pray these things in your name today. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please join me in praying the Meshimans prayer as printed in your bulletin. Almighty Father, whose ways in the sea, whose paths are in the great waters, 
whose command is over all and whose love never faileth. Let me be aware of thy presence and obedient to thy will. Keep me true to my best self, guarding me against dishonesty in purpose and in deed, and helping me so to live that I can stand unashamed and unafraid before my shipmates, my loved ones, and thee. Protect those in whose love I live. Give me the will to do my best and to accept my share of responsibilities with a strong heart and a cheerful mind. Make me considerate of those entrusted to my leadership and faithful to the duties my country has entrusted in me. Let my uniform remind me daily of the traditions of the service of which I am a part. If I am inclined to doubt, stay in my faith. If I am tempted, make me strong to resist. If I should miss the mark, give me the courage to try again. Guide me with the light of truth and keep before me the life of him by whose example and help I trust to obtain the answer to my prayer. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
may the love of God be with you as you go upon your week. May he protect you and lead you and guide you in all that you do. May your heart long for him and only him. We pray these things, this blessing, in the most holy name, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us and have a fabulous week.